Hello and welcome to the Film Comment Podcast. My name is Violet Luca, and I'm the magazine's digital editor. Paul Verhoeven is best known for his subversive, big-budget Hollywood spectacles of sex and violence. Robocop, Basic Instinct, Total Recall, Showgirls, and Starship Troopers. But his lesser-known works are just as uncompromising and vital. In this episode, I go full frontal, critically speaking, with... Adam Naiman, contributing editor for uh, Cinemascope and author for uh, a couple books, including one on Paul Verhoeven. Margaret Barton Fumo, uh, contributor to Film Comment, and I've edited a book of interviews with Paul Verhoeven that's coming out in January. And uh, I'm Benjamin Crotty, and I'm a filmmaker living in Paris. We'll examine Verhoeven's bold Dutch films, the films he made after leaving Hollywood, and his fascinations with stardom and Jesus. Here's the conversation, which was recorded before the election. So, Margaret, when we were doing the live talk a few weeks ago, I guess, at NYFF, you had mentioned that almost an aside, it was so casual, you said that in Paul Verhoeven's movies, the men are just always so emasculated and so weak. And revisiting these films and preparing for this episode, I was just really struck by how utterly factual that statement is. Um, So maybe we could start off by talking about Verhoeven's films in terms of gender. Sure. I could take that opportunity to do something that I've wanted to do, and I kind of want to plug, now that you're doing this full uh, retrospective of his work at Lincoln Center, um, I kind of want to plug Katie Tipple, which is a film that I really like a lot, or Kietje Tipple, I think (laughs) is the Dutch name for it. And it's a very early film of his. It came out after Turkish Delight, which was his first huge and remains his one of his hugest films. And it stars Monique Van de Ven, who is in Turkish Delight. Also, Rucker Hauer is in the film. And I think it makes a great companion piece to Showgirls in a lot of ways. And uh, it's one of the two or three films of his that he considers not too great. <laughs> It was intended to be a big budget uh, film and not all the funds came through. It's also a period piece, which he doesn't really do, based on a real woman who just sort of pulled herself up by her bootstraps from utter poverty, became a prostitute and just sort of made her way through Amsterdam in the late 19th century. And Monique Van de Ven's performance is really wonderful in it. But getting to the emasculated men, there are quite a few of them in this film. (laughs) Especially at the very end, the very last shot of the film, no spoilers really, but one of the men in her life, is, he has an injury, and a head injury that starts to bleed. And the very last shot of the film is she's licking the blood from his head. And it's just a fantastic way to end a film. Very similar, you know, this is, this is another offhand, but very similar to a Zawalski film, Shamanka, or the, Sh- the Shaman. It has a very, very similar ending. And who knows if there's any connection there. But it's just, it's a freeze frame on her with blood on her mouth. And I think that kind of really epitomizes the whole emasculated men (laughs) theme in Verhoeven's work. I think Kati Tipple is a great one to talk about. And you cannot just draw a line from Kati Tipple to Showgirls. I don't think you could be more correct. But also from Kati Tipple through Showgirls to Black Book. And the three of those films, I think, are his most picaresque works in that they are tours of a particular moment in time and place. They're all period pieces, even if Showgirls is a period piece made in the moment when it's set. But they are uh, picaresques in that they use this female protagonist to sort of move up and down in terms of the class strata of the society, even as her narrative moves sort of horizontally. And it's typical in picaresque fiction, especially in the Middle Ages, that it would always be a male hero. So it's interesting with Verhoeven to use a picara, a sort of female. Uh, picaresque heroine. But I mean, you talk about emasculated men. The other three films that comprise a sort of funny trilogy for him are Spetter's Fourth Man and Basic Instinct, which are sort of all about this character of a blonde in the first two films, it's Renee Sutendeck and in Sharon's, uh, in Basic Instinct, it's Sharon Stone, who essentially just kind of either devours destroys, makes wayward, or sort of, you know, drives all the men around her. I mean, in Spetters, the three competitive motocross racers all make ruins of themselves as they each date her. In The Fourth Man, there's the literal idea of skeletons in the closet. And then Basic Instinct is basically a remake of The Fourth Man, even though Joe Esterhaus didn't intend it that way. 
So I think that with Verhoeven, uh, men are often emasculated, women are powerful, but what's also interesting is that the men being emasculated doesn't necessarily make them negative types, and the women being powerful is not necessarily feminist. Right. It's certainly not necessarily a positive kind of, of power. And Basic Instinct, which my wife and I watched the other night for the umpteenth time, is a film that could really drive you crazy in terms of gender in terms of whether this is meant to be a paranoid satire of male vanity and fear with regards to women, or if this is really, truly one of the most misogynist films, like not just of the 90s, but but ever made. I mean, I have my opinions on that, but I like that there's enough space in the film that it could drive anyone nuts. I also, I rewatched um, Spedders recently, which is a very twisted film too and also has another very twisted ending which just totally annihilates any any idea of having a male a you know a strong male protagonist in that film because we ostensibly have a male protagonist in that film there's one of the spetters one of the motorcyclists that kind of stands out from the rest and he just becomes totally and literally emasculated throughout the film in the very end this is probably a spoiler but he's dead his father has sold his business and the blonde woman, Renee Sutinjik, has taken over the business of this poor dead <laughs> and this poor dead boy and his crushed father and she's selling French fries out of it. I rewatched Starship Troopers last night. Ben, that film had you said it was a major inspiration for a film you co directed Visionary Iraq. What was it about it that drove you or sort of inspired you or helped? Right, sure. Well I, I consider Starship Troopers to be like really close to like an experimental film. But yeah. I guess I should say first of all, Visionary Iraq, I guess I should briefly describe it. It's like a short film. It's kind of like a parody of this family who where there are two kids who are played by myself and the co director of the film Gabriel Lebrantes go to Iraq and we also play like their parents and there's kind of like a weird incestuous relationship between the parents and the kids and the two kids it's kind of like a weird underground send up of this conflict mm -hmm. and for me like actually I don't come from a military family but my dad was in Vietnam and I have two brothers who were in the army reserves and so it's true and I, I grew up in this kind of family ambiance where the army was kind of like a sacred cow that you could criticize like American government, but you couldn't directly criticize the army or, like, God forbid, soldiers. So I remember when I saw Starship Troopers, I was really... That's kind of what I found so surprising about the movie. I guess it's a movie where... In, in the U.S., if you ever see, I know that there was a lot of controversy around the film's like um, alleged like fascism when it came out. And it's true that like in American movies, it's like unthinkable where you have a movie where the characters that you're relating to as a spectator are part of this fascist army. Like fascism exists, but it's always like at a safe distance. So I was also kind of interested in the fact that the spectator was asked to kind of identify with his fascist soldiers. Well, no, they are. I can't remember his name. I just think of him as Doogie Howser because that's what he really he was like coming off of that. Neil Patrick Neil, Harris. Neil Patrick Harris. He is in one scene of the film. He's literally wearing like an SS uniform with the long yeah, black yeah, coat. Yeah. And then, of course, their their fatigues are very reminiscent of what Nazi soldiers would wear during that era. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and la lastly, just to conclude, I, I know that when the movie came out, Verhoeven also spoke a lot about the relationship between the movie and like Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. Yeah. And obviously the bodies of the the actors are correspond to a very like athletic yeah. <laughs> kind of Aryan ideal. Like for me when I saw it, it looked like they were just like actors from like Melrose Place or something. <laughs> like uh, so there's a weird like filtering of layering of I thought it was interesting the connection, this triangular kind of referentiality that I got from the choice of actors as well. Well, and to, and to, I mean, the layering in the film is amazing because they all have these kind of South American names and it's set in, in Buenos, Buenos Aires. Aires you yeah. know, Johnny Rico is played by the Aryan looking Casper Van Dien. So there's this implication of a kind of an American imperialist spread at this point in the near future. But I should also say that in Heinlein's novel, the source material, Johnny Rico is Filipino. Sure. However, Argentina is one of the failed white projects of Latin America where there was absolutely an almost complete genocide of the native people in Argentina. But it's, uh, and it's a very Europeanized, it's extremely Europeanized of all places. But yes, continue. But it's also a famously a hiding place for Nazis. Yes, that too. <laughs> um, but I would say that in terms of the, I love what you just said about triangular referentiality and like, you know, 
Starship Troopers is also essentially a remake of Soldier of Orange. And the films have one scene in them that is actually identical, which is the call to war. In Soldier of Orange, they're all watching tennis, and then on the radio, you hear the actual address saying, oh yeah, by the way, World War II has started. And in Starship Troopers, similarly, everyone gathers to the TV to say, the bugs have attacked us. So in both films, there's this kind of call to war. And it's interesting that Soldier of Orange is absolutely about the resistance to that, but it's not a noble or heroic resistance. In fact, it's these rich private school kids get disabused of their notions about what rebellion means. Whereas in Starship Troopers, it's this triumphal narrative, where in the end, the recruits sign up to, you, you can only function as a citizen in this society if you join the army. We're not on the side of principled dissent. We're actually on the side of that fascist power. And at the end, it literally ends, we talked, Benjamin talked about it being essentially an experimental movie. I mean, there's something deeply surreal and avant-garde about the ending, which is a direct address to the audience being like, we need you, join us, you know, join up, come and, come and fight on. I mean, the fact that that played in multiplexes and not just that, but was a hit, it's surreal to consider 20 years on. Well, also, I think it's avant-garde in the sense that you, the viewer, or whoever the the narrator, the films, the the, the film sort of perspective is through browsing the internet. Yep. You know, learn more, learn more here, and you never learn more. <laughs> you always just see the soundbite, and then you instantly move on. And I think it's such a you know one of the great things about RoboCop or Total Recall. Uh, you know, these little like little commercials are interfacing with television and what like how insidious and fucked up television is and then this is like you're not in a world where that exists you're literally inside that media landscape and you cannot get out and if you try to you know take off your helmet and see the world without this protective screen over yourself you die you know when his uh, when that one guy gets killed during the training exercise like it's such a it's so interesting what happens. The interstitial film for Verhoeven between the Dutch and the American halves of his Curry makes a medieval film, mm -hmm. which culminates, I think, the kind of very, not analog exactly, but the kind of biological old world aspect of the Netherlands half of his career. And then literally the first image in Robocop is on television. And that's the difference between working in the Netherlands. Not that there's not technology in the Netherlands, but like the technocratic side of Verhoeven's filmmaking, which in a way made him a bit of a contender to your Spielbergs and your Camerons. I mean, that's who he was industrially in his American filmmaking career, regardless of the satire or the artistry. I mean, commercially, he's, he's that kind of filmmaker. So it's so interesting that it's not till he gets to America that that side of him becomes unleashed. But that's a significant part of who he is as an artist. It's just he managed to take that technocratic side, that pop culture side, which didn't exist as much in the Dutch films, and then take the other things that were present in the Dutch films, the play with gender, the, the play with sexuality, the bad boy thing, the attack on religion, basically your whole Verhoeven playbook and then filter it through the pop media stuff. And that's when he becomes quite formidable, I think. Well, also in Flesh and Blood, there's a scene where warriors or whatever <laughs> take rats infected with the plague and throw it, catapult it into this castle where the other people are. And it, and it lands beautifully in the w water well. And uh, Verhoeven has said in interviews that he likens that to an early form of biological warfare. Yeah. So he really had that on his mind, even when he was making that film, just the technology of war. He has another character in that film that he likes to think of as a kind of a da Vinci type character who's into the science as it was at that time. So it's something that was just always on his mind. He's, he's always been very fascinated with the history of World War II also, and he really works that into all of his films. Could you sort of elucidate that? Because, I mean, obviously he grew up when the war was going on, but why is that? Well, I mean, I'm of the mind that Black Book's his best film. And I, I, I think that I think Black Book's a, a great film. I think it has the best ending of any of his movies. I think it has a real personal stake in it, but also this real shameless potboiler quality. And what it sort of gets at, like no war film I've ever seen, is the complete lack of safety and certainty in that period. And the idea that you are always focused on your own survival, which means you become alienated from who you really are. Like the Mata Harry character that she has, it's not just a kind of you know, sexy, exploitative, you know, Jew in love with a Nazi thing. There's a comment on the schizophrenia of being occupied, 
and of sort of trying to survive in, in wartime. And I think that the absolute fluid morality and the absolute contingency of existence in Black Book, I think it's the most crystalline expression of who he is and some of his smarter ideas as an artist. Like he has some brilliant ideas as an artist that are also kind of dumb. They're like <laughs> brilliant and dumb simultaneously. I think Black Book is a film that is just consistently, relentlessly smart. And I mean, uh, it's also his, like Soldier of Orange and Starship Troopers, it's kind of a pure war film and kind of a pure resistance film. I don't know if, if Margaret or Ben are big fans of Black Book, but to me, that's the that's the crowning film for him. Yeah, I think it's just fantastic. I, th I thought it was just the most amazing return to form for him when it came out in so many ways. And it's like a picaresque too, in that she's just never at rest. Never, everything is just another story in her life that keeps moving and changing just constantly. Could you briefly describe Black Book? Because I feel like that's a film that maybe sort of after his, before we started recording, you said that he had like, what, like three or four career downfalls, let's say. Well, he's a picaresque figure because Verhoeven is. <laughs> Verhoeven because in the picaresque, what happens is you succeed, you succeed, you succeed, you fuck up, and then they kick you out and you have to start again. Uh -huh. So he got to the point in the Netherlands where they had no choice but to praise him. And then with Spetters, they had no choice but to kick him out. And then in America, Basic Instinct makes $400 million and then he makes Showgirls and that's it. Even if he made two other American films, I mean, that's that. Mm -hmm. And so Black Book is kind of the return of the prodigal. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that he comes back, makes the most expensive Dutch film of all time. It is a film that builds to the point that the Dutch resistance is filled with anti-Semitism. The defeat of the Nazis involves behavior that is literally said, because it's not a subtle film, this is as bad as the Nazis. <laughs> and that ends with the idea that the deep ambivalence, right? And so in the story of this Jewish singer who has to pretend to be uh, not Jewish so that she can survive and then falls in love with a Nazi officer, it's very period specific. And it's also, I mean, this might be in your in the book. You can, I, I, wa I really want to see if this is in your book. I've never wanted to read a book more in my life. Uh, this is a film he wanted to make for 30 years, right? He, he had the idea for this in the 70s. Yeah, with he used his, his he worked again with Gerard Soderman who wrote all of his Dutch films. I was going to say though, he was the prodigal son. And yet, there was still a contingent of uh, Dutch critics who really spat on him, though, for making the film, that they thought, even though he clearly sets up this statement that, you know, a lot of people in the resistance were just as bad as Nazis, but a lot of the, his Dutch critics complained that he still glorified them too much, that he, he <laughs> added his Verhoeven touch or whatever to the film, that it was too fantastical and it was too Hollywood, and that... I think one of them, their specific complaint was that they were too well fed. <laughs> and then Verhoeven just spat back at that and he gave historical details to why, what they were eating at the time and why they were that well fed and how that was also historically accurate. But um, yeah, it, it was a great success in the Netherlands too as well. But there was still a backlash that, you know, appeared on Dutch television and um, in the press. But if he doesn't get a backlash, he's doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> That's what's kind of amazing about Elle is that this is a film that almost everybody sort of seems to like, I think rightly so. But to me, there's also something a little, as, as a big Verhoeven fan. We're all anticipating the backlash from before it even started. Yeah. I mean. But I think maybe, because I, I, I was thinking about this, just how much media has changed. You know, if we're talking about so much of what happens in his films is a response to a media, a larger media culture, or at least sort of the American one. Where is L going to play? It's not going to play in a multiplex. It's not going to play. It's it's going to be on like VOD and in some art house theaters on the coast and in big cities. And like those audiences know. Those audiences are like familiar. They the audiences that are going to be sort of you know exposed to his work are they're going to be familiar with Brecht. They're also familiar with his films themselves. So it's not going to be as much of a potential disaster, let's say. They're it going to has be able been to submitted as the Oscar. Uh, the <laughs> Netherlands have submitted it in contention as their, their submission for Oscar for Best Foreign Film. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I mean, can we go back, uh, Adam, you were saying Verhoeven has uh, smart, dumb ideas. Could we could we parse that out a little bit more? <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, again, I, I, I say that with the utmost respect. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> and I actually sort of said before I came here, I almost didn't want to talk about Showgirls because I've kind of <laughs> done that already. But I mean, Showgirls is a film, the smartness of which is indivisible from maybe dumb's the wrong word, but the obviousness of it, the, mm -hmm. the, the overtness of it, the, the absolute sort of 
brute blunt force head trauma of coarseness yeah, yeah. of it. And so, I mean, maybe dumb's the wrong idea, but Starship Troopers too is a film that has dialogue and scenes and characters and ideas that are perilously close to being craven and pandering and obvious. I mean, I've always thought that uh, I wrote about this with Pharrell in Cinemascope that Verhoeven in some ways reminds me of Hanukkah in that he's a bit of a, a scold and he's a bit of a, of a guy with a, a critical attitude towards spectatorship and pleasure. He just also is like, I also I love this stuff. So he doesn't take the fourth wall down. He kind of keeps the fourth wall up and then jumps into the ball pit with everybody else because he likes the stuff too. He likes sex. He likes violence. He, he doesn't pretend that he doesn't get off on it. So this film like Elle, I sort of said that, you know, Cachet, which is an excellent film, takes two hours to arrive at the point that like people are assholes and life sucks. And Verhoeven, you know that before the film starts. Like that's his yeah. jumping off point. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, one of the reasons Starship Troopers is so good or one of the reasons Basic Instinct is so good is you could pop the hood and see them as a critique of their genre or a critique of their cultural climate, but they are also just like completely craven, pandering entertainments. Even Black Book, I mean, you were talking about what, what Margaret was saying was absolutely fascinating where people are like, you know, uh, they, they, they blame him for a lack of realism. The film's ridiculous. I mean, the <laughs> film has ridiculous technicolor geysers of blood and the most shameless pot boiler plotting like this is a film where someone is like suffocated inside a coffin and the screws of the coffin are being turned by a picture of people who he killed by their daughter like it is absolutely not an austere realistic film that's why he's good it's why Brian De Palma is good. It's why it's why you know a lot of filmmakers are good. If if he ever becomes subtle, which L is comes close to at times, it, it's almost a problem because it it leaves open certain uncomfortable ambiguities. I yeah, mean, yeah, I would agree. I was just thinking about that suspenseful moment in Black Book that it depends on the uh, color of her pubic hair. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I mean. But you want to okay? Like here's here's maybe the best smart dumb Verhoeven thing I can think of in this in Black Book when the pubic hair thing happens, right? And he realizes that she's Jewish and she's like, are these Jewish breasts? And, you know, puts her, his hands on her breasts. That's the Merchant of Venice. That's half not a Jew eyes. If you prick me, do we not bleed? That's what that is. It's that, it's that call for basic humanity beyond ethnicity, beyond religion. It's also in the context of a scene where uh, Carice Van Houten is full frontal naked being groped by a Jewish girl being groped by a Nazi officer. It's the night porter except it's not serious, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is like a, the combination of like softcore Shakespeare and basic narrative suspense there. It's kind of amazing. And it never stops and says, hey, look what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of amazing filmmaker he often is, I think. Yeah, I would agree. And, and also his total reverence for Haneke. I mean, Haneke is like his favorite filmmaker right now. He, he told me in that he likes Michael Haneke and The Hangover. <laughs> And I said, that's good, because if, if you divide Michael Hanukkah by The Hangover, you get your movies. <laughs> ben, were you as sort of taken in by Black Book, or are there other films that Verhoeven has done that you, you know, sort of as intriguing to you as someone who also tries to parse out things that are uncomfortable or challenging? I have to be honest that, like, I saw his American movies as a young person, and then I've only seen Elle, so I'm, I'm not an expert on all of his films. I haven't seen Black Book, unfortunately. But I guess something else that I think is kind of interesting to talk about, but I don't know how conceptual his casting choices are, because even, for example, in L, for a French audience, like the choice of these secondary characters, um, well, there's obviously like Isabelle, Isabelle Huppert, but like her character, although it's not the kind of character she always plays, it's kind of, it's, she's like a smart, kind of frigid woman, and so it's not shocking for a French public to see her in this role right. but um like uh Laurent, Laurent Lafitte who plays like her neighbor and Virginie Afira who plays the, the other neighbor there like Virginie Afira like came to fame as host of the French version of like American Idol <laughs> so she kind of has like a reputation as like a very normal actress <laughs> and it's kind of the same with Laurent Lafitte he's like a member of like the Comédie Française he's kind of like a French Tom Hanks he's like a very kind of normal good actor and so seeing them in these roles where they're these kind of like suburban people with these weird hidden sexual perversions is kind of like an unusual maybe conceptual casting choice and obviously for me as like a young person who grew up watching Saved by the Bell yes the choice of Elizabeth Dorothy was like a crazy like conceptual choice which I I don't know I just I just wonder what have he, if he speaks about that or what he says about that or he has said that he was clueless about where those actors came from 
for Starship Troopers that he didn't watch those shows, he wasn't aware of that, and that mainly he cast them because they were cheaper. <laughs> and that he would have liked to have had. He said, well, and also that it was important that they were of a certain age, though. He really wanted fresh faces and he wanted young people. And he said he would have liked someone like, this is at the time in the 90s, Chris O'Donnell. <laughs> he would have liked to have Chris O'Donnell, but he would be too expensive. Someone like um, Christian Slater, again, this is in the 90s, who was just a little bit too over the hill. And yeah, the the casting of Elizabeth Berkeley is is almost like a Verhoeven film in and of its own that she just totally presented herself to him as Nomi Malone, just sort of burst into the casting office and and just had herself casted really. But I don't know if you guys watched Saved by the Bell, but it was it's like extra weird because like her character on Saved by the Bell was kind of like a feminist and she was like pretty high strong and like. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I wrote a bit about the, I wrote a bit about that in the in the Showgirls book and the. Uh, I, and the yeah. idea that, you know, Jesse Spano was also a dancer, right? right? You know, like that was an aspiration that she had. She was a valedictorian who also wanted to be a dancer. So in Showgirls, just the valedictorian part is replaced by like crack addicted prostitute. But the dancer <laughs> thing remains. But I would say, but I would but I would say that the conceptual aspect of his casting also has to do with whether his stakes are up or down career wise. When he makes basic instinct, he can take Michael Douglas and all of the signifiers and baggage that Michael Douglas post fatal attraction has, and you plug Michael Douglas into that part and he doesn't he barely has to act and you're like oh it's fatal attraction guy okay that's the movie that we're in look at total recall where arnold schwarzenegger plays a guy whose life isn't exciting enough i mean whatever one thinks of total recall i think it's one of his weakest movies but that joke in and of itself the casting conceptual joke is brilliant arnold schwarzenegger is a guy whose life needs an adrenaline jolt arnold schwarzenegger is a blue collar jackhammer operator so that when he then suddenly becomes the hero of a mars adventure he doesn't have to change right. and that's the big difference between verhoven's version of the one David Cronenberg was going to make where, you know, I think it would have been like Peter Weller would have played that part because it would have been like Naked Lunch. I think right. Cronenberg's <laughs> Total Recall would have been like Cronenberg's Naked Lunch, a kind of meek, mild-mannered guy who needs to have an exciting life and transform into a larger-than-life figure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for what it's worth, I think Schwarzenegger's hilarious in Total Recall because he's always best when he's being cast as the butt of the movie's joke a little mm -hmm. bit, like the Terminator 2 where he's kind of like a sweet dad figure. Yeah. And so in Total Recall, I love Schwarzenegger as like a geek or a nerd who doesn't know how to fire a gun and who doesn't know what he's getting into. Whereas after Showgirls, I mean, the par partially the people he cast in Starship Troopers, it's like that's who he could get because he had just made Showgirls and all that, that, all that had happened there. He was incredibly respectful of Arnold Schwarzenegger, though. Paul Verhoeven is Arnold Schwarzenegger's biggest fan. And he <laughs> had a lot of faith in him as a serious actor, too, which clearly he's not doing in Total Recall. But he also saw a comedy in him that other directors did not see at the time, and he used that. Well, they were going to make a Crusades movie together. You know, in the history of both of their careers, and maybe of Western civilization as we know it, would be different had they made a... a if they, no, if they had been at the peak of their powers and they had made like a... Christian Crusades film at the end of the 90s. I mean, who knows what that would have looked like, but didn't happen. And Schwarzenegger also kind of sauntered into his life at a time where he was still very emotionally wounded by his breakup with Rucker Hauer. Yeah. The, <laughs> new, the new Rutger. Could you describe that? <laughs> Did I get well, he and Rucker kind of came up together in the Netherlands. He, uh, I think his first big success was for directing this television show called Floris in the Netherlands, which was like a Dutch Ivanhoe starring Rucker Hauer. And then he kept casting him in his films. I mean, first, of course, Turkish Delight, which is considered the best Dutch film of the century <laughs> that they call it there in the Netherlands. And he kept casting him up through Flesh and Blood, which was his in-between film, which was his Dutch, Spanish, American co-production. And by that point, Rucker had, you know, I'm sure because of his success with Verhoeven's film, probably Soldier of Orange, he had already been in Blade Runner and Lady Hawk, and apparently he had a really big head about it. So when he filmed um, Flesh and Blood, he was just not very nice, and he kind of sided with another unruly cast of Americans, a mixed cast of Americans, Australians, some a few other Dutch, and he just they just sort of retaliated against Verhoeven, and Verhoeven took it very, very personally, and I like to think of it as almost like a fractured romance, bromance between the two of them, that Verhoeven kept speaking about 
uh, Hauer in a very touching way throughout the rest of his career. I like this idea of talking of, of talking about actors because it is very fascinating. But can we talk about Robocop? Yeah. One of my favorites. And I grew up in the 90s and I, I didn't actually watch any of these movies because I just thought they were straight up problematic. I just thought they were straight up sexist, fascist. I lived in a place where you, you know, Irony Shield was very thick. You cannot. <laughs> um, I didn't realize. I thought, oh, Robocop, it's just like some dumb action movie. And then I saw it as an adult and I was like, oh. Oh my God, this is amazing. There's like a joke in every frame. Like it's brilliant. But just there's that scene in RoboCop. And I remember when I was a kid, Roger Ebert reviewed it. And he talked about this scene at such length in his review where the ED-209 malfunctions. And for some reason, Ebert put, I mean, not in a bad way, he put like three paragraphs of his RoboCop review about that and about the cuts that the MPAA insisted on and about the scene being funny. And so when I teach Verhoeven, I use that scene both as an idea of that Monty python ask idea of like gory brutal violence mm -hmm. going on and on and on it goes past the point of being shocking and into a kind of cartoon yeah. diegesis where it's I mean it, it doesn't hurt anymore right it's just so excessive but i love the 80s-ness of that in another way there's this kind of top-down corporate violence where the low-level functionaries the one who tests out the equipment sort of he gets killed and then it's the people above him on the chain who get yelled at by the guy who's at the very top who could kind of care less that his entry-level employees kind of been shot up yeah and i mean Look, I mean, people have already, not to the point that it's not interesting to talk about, but the details of that movie are well established. It's set in Detroit, you know, and Detroit had the auto industry collapse in the 80s. And so the idea of like human and assembly line fusing and the idea of old Detroit and, and new Detroit. I mean, Verhoeven's talked about this a lot. I can't wait to read whatever interviews are in your book about this, where it was a chance for him to comment on a Reagan era period, not just the media of it, but the idea of expendability, the expendability of cops, the militarization of a kind of a police force. And that's what's amazing about RoboCop is that stuff's all really overt and you can't miss it. But it doesn't do what the bad RoboCop remake did, which is really nudge you to sort of be like, and it's important that I'm saying this. Right. <laughs> There's this weird effortlessness to RoboCop, which is a completely transparent allegory, but the allegory is so transparent that you can also just enjoy it as, a, as an action film. It's really not like proud of itself. I don't know if you'd agree, Margaret, or how you'd talk sure, about it. I mean, it. and the Jesus allegory sure. that he put in there on purpose. The and American Jesus, the because American... he doesn't turn the other cheek. He stabs the guy through the neck. Yes, yes, <laughs> and that had a lot to do very specifically with the level of violence uh, that he wanted his crucifixion so to speak to be so brutal and violent that it has so much to do with the rest of the film and where in the Robocop remake it's just uh, a sudden explosion and that's it I mean so it totally changes the trajectory of the film by not having that scene as violent as Verhoeven wanted it to be I was going to say about actors I love how he, Verhoeven, pushed against any notion of any kind of a romance with Nancy Allen and anyone else in the film to the point where he had her tape down her breasts. <laughs> and then he wanted her to be masculinized so, just so that she could have equal footing in the film. I mean, this is coming from a man that a lot of people complain of as being sexist and, you know... he. That's that's another argument. But in this film, I like how he did that and he had to kind of fight to do that. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the Peter Weller performance, it's one of the most soul. I think it's the most soulful male performance in any of his movies. There's a lot of very soulful and really in some ways um, either melancholy or in the case of like Berkeley and Showgirls, like it's kind of just, it's it's tough to watch for different reasons, sort of female performances in his films. And I think the consensus best acting in his movies is women, whether it's, you know, uh, Sharon Stone or, or, or Carice Van Houten or Huppert, probably, you know, first among equals. But I mean, what Weller does in RoboCop is kind of amazing, which is a character who's really monotone and flat to begin with, and then who by increments kind of regains his humanity. The idea that regaining his humanity culminates in an absolutely savage act of retributive violence <laughs> is, you know, part of what's sort of bleak about that movie. Mm -hmm. But he talked when we were in Key West about the absolute audience eruption at that moment. And, you know, a filmmaker like Michael Haneke or a filmmaker who's really concerned about violence in American movies would hear what Paul was saying about that and be like, that's horrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, that you've calibrated your movie to build to the point where an audience of people is cheering the violent murder of the bad guy. But within the narrative logic of RoboCop, I'm sorry, it's an incredibly satisfying 
moment. He says that the audience at the Urban Ameri- the, the, the I forget what city it was, but it was a big downtown city screening. And right before he gives his name as being not Robocop, but Murphy, yeah. he says the audience all said it. Before they, before the line came, it's like the audience knew that that's what he was going to say. I mean, you can say what you want about touching a popular nerve and what's dangerous about that versus what's kind of good about it, but that's quite something. That point, talking about what a remake gets wrong, it's very easy to do, but also I think, you know, you're locking in on something crucial here because it's like Verhoeven, as we've sort of danced around this whole conversation, Huge into the Bible. That guy loves his Bible. He's like some special, What he's in the order of... He's a Jesus scholar. Yes, he's a Jesus scholar, yeah. straight up, I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in the, the original RoboCop, the touching aspect of Weller's performance, I would totally agree it, in your reading of it, although Verhoeven has also said that it's a sense of lost paradise that he wanted to convey, that it's, again, really inserting Jesus into (laughs) into this allegory of the film, whereas in the remake, it's clearly sentimentalized, you know, his lost family. He he lost his it's his his wife and his and his son and they keep going back to that over and over again, whereas Verhoeven doesn't. And I found it interesting too that when he was doing Q and A's for L at the New York Film Festival, that he even pointed out a few an allegories that he sees in L with the Christian church, you know. Well, the most the most exceptional scene in L, I will not spoil the actual narrative outcome of it, but there's a conversation in which the staging involves a really shocking revelation and a really shocking response to that revelation, which is framed by leftover nativity scene figures <laughs> that have kind of been stuck in the back of a truck. And that's not incidental. You know, I mean, this is a film that's been staged. The mise-en-scene in this film is within an inch of its life. And so in his way, he always gets his kind of licks in. It's like in Black Book, the porridge scene, where the family is giving her her porridge and she has to say grace, the Jewish singer, or else she can't eat. So she makes a little cross with syrup in the porridge, reads grace, and the the Christian father smiles at her. And then she mixes the porridge all up and destroys the cross, right? I mean, even when it's a little two-second throwaway thing, there's the, I think what Violet said is very smart, there's always the acknowledgement of the religious interest and the religious fascination and then a complete irreverence towards it, which is almost unmatched. I can't think of another filmmaker who is both as interested in and as irreverent towards Christian symbolism and and Christian ideas as as Verhoeven. If he was slightly more respectful respectable, he might get in even more trouble, I think. The religion thing is so fascinating because it's like, I think why he can do that. Christianity is such an invisible part of American culture, but it's always totally present in ways that you don't expect or like it will just, you know, bubble up in weird, in everything. When I saw Elle, it was interesting because again, like the character of, the na- of these neighbors there, the character played by Virginie Afira is like very, you know, she has like a deep faith and she's like very vocal about it. And I have to say, there's something about Elle, which I know it's based on a French novel, but to me it really seems like an American film that's been like set in France because all of, it's a very like suburban context. There's a lot of stuff about weird neighbors and lyrism and suburban isolation. And this character of the Virginie Afira, for me, that's like an American character, like the weird like American neighbor who's like really Christian. And it doesn't really, you don't really encounter this kind of person in France. So it was, it was interesting to me more as like a weird transposition, this this character. Well, this was originally supposed to be in America and then it was, it was literally moved over, right? French novel rewritten to be American. The video game material was changed from a screenwriting company when it was going to be set in the States. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get an American actor. So the word he used when I interviewed him for Scope, he told me that it, they re-Frenched it, <laughs> right? So it's, you know, I mean, so what Benjamin was saying, I mean, it's a really good observation because there are certain things in the film that were developed for it to be set in an American city and then they sort of kept them and put them back into the French context. I wouldn't be surprised at all if they kind of Americanized her character a little bit, um, especially in relation to her religion for the film. I want to know, what does he say about stuff, business is business? Like, do you have interviews from that yeah, period that I are do. also like in the era of him being really young? Because yeah. one of the things about Verhoeven, I say this with admiration, is he, he has an ego because he's earned it, right? And by the time he talks about his film now, there's this kind of old master aspect and he can sort of say 
this is how things went and this is how they should have gone. But I mean, what did he sound like or what are his interviews like from that early period where he's in ascendance? It's pretty great. But also <laughs> if you read like Rob Van Sheer's biography of him, which is just so fantastic, he describes how every single time that Verhoeven directs, though, he's crippled with stress and anxiety and fears, you know, that he may not show. I'm sure he doesn't show, actually, on the outside, but he has a lot of, of, of fear when he's directing. And in his early interviews, like for Business is Business, Business is Business was a hugely successful film. Basically, just about every film that he made in the Netherlands sort of topped itself as the most successful film in the Netherlands Except at the Spatters. time. It said, well, Spetters actually was successful, though. But, but, but hated but as well. Yeah, just reviled, totally reviled. But uh, when business... National anti spetters Committee. Yes, NASA, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and when Business is Business came out, it was just a huge huge success and he was interviewed kind of in the middle of that while it was still going on and yet he's talking about how things that he wants to go back and change about it or how he wants to change it for different audiences or or how he'd like to go fix this or that and this is a film that is has unprecedented success and yet these things are still going through his mind i thought that was one of the most interesting things that came out of his business is business era can I ask Ben if about one the only movie we haven't mentioned, and maybe you've seen it, if it's, it's one of the American ones, what do you think of Hollow Man, which has an experimental aspect to it, too? I mean, that is a weird movie. I don't know if you've seen it recently or if you have anything to say about it. Actually, I have not seen Hollow Man, sorry. <laughs> but, um, you and no, a sorry. lot of other people. <laughs> yeah. First, what is it about, and then why do you feel like it's sort well, it's of his, experimental? It's, it's his Invisible Man movie, and a lot of people have tried the clever thing of being like hollow man because he wanted to disappear and he was leaving America. He doesn't really deny that, but that is a film of such bad vibes, right? Like that is a film where the protagonist is unambiguously the villain. The characters played by Elizabeth Shue and Josh Brolin, they're like the ingenues in a 30s romantic film. Like, who cares? The movie is with Kevin Bacon, this brilliant scientist who makes himself invisible, acts like a creep. We're privy to his worst thoughts, his kind of worst feelings. I mean, I have heard, he didn't tell me this, nor have I read this in interviews, perhaps it's in your book, that he wanted to kind of go further with the transgressive aspect of like what an invisible character could do or sort of be capable of. But what's just strange about that film is it's completely subterranean. Like almost the entire film is set underground. It opens with this long kind of like action movie chase sequence with this gorilla that's kind of being like refigured on screen, like going from invisible kind of to visible. And there's something so artificial about it. I kind of don't know how to, to say it. It's like it's so fakey and so phony and so swathed and kind of special effects it's like the one of his movies that i kind of can't get a read on because often when you watch something you just kind of think well maybe that's just bad but it's not yeah. with hollow man i'm not so sure if i add the but it's not mm -hmm. afterwards and you know the fact that that's the last movie he made in america hopefully not the last movie he will make but if you ask him he's not so sure he's ever going to make one in america again it's just this weird really sour coda i think to this amazing period of 15 years well, it's based on H.G. Wells' The Invisible Man and Plato's, I think, the second book of Plato's Republic. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is, states that if a man has the opportunity to become invisible, he will inevitably commit evil acts. <laughs> so that was also Verhoeven's thinking when he was making that film. So, yes, yeah, sour is a perfect word to describe that. Well, and just and it's just a film of such casual violence, right? Like the the there's this horrible stuff towards the end where everything is literally covered in blood. Like you could call the movie Flesh and Blood, because in order to make the Kevin Bacon character visible, they're like throwing balloons and packets of blood all over the place, and so he's made visible only because he's dripping with red, which again looks like I mean it's it's very close to looking like abstract. Yeah. Uh, you know, almost a kind of like abstract patterning visually, like it's very strange looking. You could take screen grabs from that movie and it would probably be the weirdest looking of all of uh, Verhoeven's movies. But also it's like a reliance on CGI even beyond Starship Troopers to the point where it's just kind of redundant. The effects are and remain the great standout of that film. And I think they're still pretty good, actually. Definitely for the time, they were very good. And if you think about it, all the money that went into the effects equals a lot more a lot more influence of the studio. 
And I think at a certain point he was just like, let me just make, I'm going to make a horror movie, you know, because it just turns into, it's science fiction that turns into horror at the end of it all. And, and it did pretty well at the box office, actually. Yeah, it did. And, you know, it leaves open the question, too, of, I mean, he, when I did the Showgirls thing with him in Florida, and he, he said that he's always watching American special effects movies mm-hmm. because he's waiting for a moment like there was with Jurassic Park or there was with, with certain films where he, you can see a new kind of special effects that you can use in a new way. So I don't think that that's off his mind, the idea of making one of these big kinds of movies again. And that would be fascinating to see him do that even 20 years on from when he did it the last time. I am reminded of what James Cameron said when they almost took Avatar away from him, which was, do you want Paul Verhoeven to direct this? <laughs> and I wish he would have. The answer is yes. Yes, please. I didn't know that. Guys, well, ad wizards, you know that. get it together. But you, do you know the famous line he's had about Return of the Jedi? Which is? He was supposedly kind of sort of, I don't know if this is in your book, but okay. well, then you say it. It's in your book. Oh, uh, well, just that he, after Soldier of Orange, was a big hit and a, a lot of Americans really loved it, including Barbara Streisand. And uh, Steven Spielberg. And Steven Spielberg, especially Steven Spielberg, invited him to come over to the U.S. and tour the studios with him. And well, first of all, <laughs> Steven Spielberg was kind of turned off from Verhoeven because he saw Turkish Delight and thought it was porn. Yep. <laughs> but then he just loved Soldier of Orange so much because it's such a great action, you know, war film. And he had him come over to the U.S. and took him around the studios. And a- a- apparently he had in mind that he was going to try to influence George Lucas to hire him, hire Verhoeven to direct Turn of the Jedi. But then he happened to see Spetters and again was just like <laughs> clutched his pearls <laughs> At the sexual content and, and decided against it. But so so Paul's line was that if I had made Return of the Jedi, the Ewoks would have all been fucking each other. <laughs> <laughs> or that was the fear. Right, that was the fear. And so with Avatar, the Nevi would all be fucking each other. Yeah, from all sorts of from crazy f- 3D angles. Yeah. Like that would have been. Didn't the same thing happen to David Lynch where he went over, he was invited over to direct one of the sequels to Star Wars and he had like this terrible migraine at Skywalker Ranch and he's like, got really ill and he's like, I have to get out of here. And then instead he made Dune, which, yes, that was the right thing to do. I don't care. Uh, come at me. <laughs> yeah. So we could sort of leave it there before we close, as we always do. It would be great if we could go around and say one film that we saw recently that we liked. I don't know if you've seen this movie, uh, Tenue de Soiree. I don't know if it was released in the US. It's from like a 1986 movie by Bertrand Blier, mm-hmm. which I just saw recently and like Gerard <laughs> Depardieu is in it. And it's like, it's the same guy that made the Valseuse. And it's a movie about this really poor like hobo couple and Gerard Depardieu befriends them. And, um, He's like really charismatic and he convinces them to start robbing these bourgeois like homes with him. So they form this like threesome. But Gerard Depardieu is really seduced by the man of the couple who's played by this very like short, bald, like French actor. And uh, they like start having this homosexual relationship, which the guy's girlfriend Monique like encourages him to do because they're she's like um, into the fact that they're like getting more and more money with these robberies. But it, the movie, it's just like it's like more and more than usual because like Gerard Depardieu then sells the woman to like a pimp and so he's just like alone now with the other guy and they form like this weird domestic couple but Gerard Depardieu like loses interest in the other guy and he the other guy starts assuming this kind of like really submissive domestic role like dusting and cooking for him and like Gerard Depardieu like sleeps around Anyways, it, go, it, gets, it gets really weird, and they all end up, the three characters end up, like, reunited at the end, and they've all, like, become prostitutes that, like, dress like women. But it was, like, a big commercial film in, like, the 80s, so it's just, like, a really crazy, like, it, can, it kind of feels like a dream. Like, it starts out with one idea, and then it just, like, gets weirder and, like, follows the ideas, like, super far. So, I don't know, it's a fascinating movie, and it was also, the soundtrack is also by... Uh, Serge Gainsbourg, so it's like got really nice. What? Oh, it sound, this this sounds like a movie you just made up. This gonna, is the craziest fucking thing gonna, I've ever heard. We're gonna reunite in one week's time and have a podcast about this movie. <laughs> yes, I like. I really suggest that. <laughs> what is it called again? It's called Tenue de Soirée, like uh, evening clothes. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Um, awesome. Well, a movie I saw was the first thing I've ever programmed for this place in uh, L.A. called Veggie Cloud. And the film is The Rise and Rise of Michael Rimmer. 
It was written and shot in 1969 by John Cleese, Peter Cook, Graham Chapman, and also the director, Kevin Billington. And it is really beautifully shot. There are a ton of like theater actors, screen actors from like the 40s and 50s in Britain, and they do these just absolutely lyrical, wonderful, very deadpan performances of this, you know, utterly absurd a python as material sort of you know it, it has a narrative but it, there are definitely sort of sketchy moments in it let's say and it's about this guy played by peter cook who just sort of appears out of nowhere one day at this rundown ad agency he's very obsessed with polling and getting ahead he's very sweet and you know attractive because he's peter cook but he is also utterly ruthless in everything that he does and eventually he becomes the conservative prime minister and it's it's really fascinating, and it's one of those films that I cannot stress enough, meant to be parody, and now everything in it is just real. <laughs> so um, can't recommend it enough. I went to the Toronto After Dark Film Festival to see Kyoshi Kurosawa's Creepy, yes, which I quite enjoyed. Um, I'm a big, big fan of Cure, which I think is one of the great, not just horror movies, but really just one of the great kind of genre art movies of the 90s. And I don't think this is quite as good, but it's definitely a sequel or a continuation or a reframing of some of the same ideas about choice and will and that kind of thin line between normal and abnormal behavior or normal and aberrant desire. And the thing about Kurosawa is, I mean, I actually, I feel really bad because I think he's a great filmmaker and I haven't seen stuff like daguerreotype and 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 real yet it just keeps missing my schedule at tiff but i was reminded watching creepy that even if the material is kind of pot boilerish and this really is kind of on a script level like kiyoshi kurosawa's prisoners you know like it's a really pulpy genre thing that guy's command of and you know i'm, I'm saying things i'm supposedly not supposed to because it sounds pretentious but you know his command of space mm -hmm. his command of depth his command of of light he's world class absolutely and even this kind of b-ish movie every shot and cut is sometimes an event with him and that it, it, it was just fascinating to watch it with an audience because the audience is reacting to the plot but I don't think they would have that reaction to the plot which is kind of silly if the images were not so mesmerizing I mean it's an amazing piece of craft even if I'm not sure it's a great film well I just did this a week ago so I'm still working on Cleopatra ah! <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I was brushing up on Verhoeven, so I watched Spedders again, Katie Tipple, and Turkish Delight to go back to the to, to the Dutch films. But And also, I just like to watch always, all the time, I like to watch old episodes of Dragnet. <laughs> I have a fondness for Jack Webb. All the Jack Webb Dragnets. I have no interest at all in any remakes or anything like that. Yeah, like the Dan Aykroyd Dragnet? I just don't care. <laughs> you know, he's... <laughs> But I love, my favorite are the 60s. There was like just three seasons of in the late 60s of Dragnet that was in color. And it, I think it looks beautiful too. It's very cheap and beautiful looking. And it's just his perspective. I mean, he was an ass. You know, he was super conservative, you know, but a talented man. He was incredibly conservative, hated communists, you know, all, all of that. Would, would name any name that he could. But I love his perspective of like 60s counterculture and hippies and how he portrayed that <laughs> in the show. And I just never get enough of it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> this was wonderful. Thanks, Violet. Thank you. And now, here's Margaret Barton Fumo's interview with Verhoeven about his latest film, L. If you haven't seen the film, you might want to see it first and come back. It's chock full of spoilers and alternative theories. Hello, this is Margaret Barton Fumo for our Film Comment podcast. I'm here interviewing Paul Verhoeven. I've been contributing to Film Comment for about 10 years, and I have a monthly column called Deep Cuts on film and music. So I thought I'd start with just a small detail from Elle that, that I liked a lot. In this book of interviews that I've put together with you that date back to 1968, um, I have this one interview I've included. It's from 1984. It's very early, and uh, it's probably one of your first English interviews, and in it you talk about how much you like Brian Ferry. Right. <laughs> and then I noticed in uh, L you use a Roxy Music song. Yes, I did. I thought did. that was wonderful. I guess you've been a constant fan for the past uh, 30 yes, years. Yes, in years. fact, the scene was much longer. Mm -hmm. in, in the When we had the first um, uh, editing of the movie uh, version, um, there was another scene there where the music of uh, Brian Fresh music was much more dominant. But somehow, um, 
the scene the scene itself didn't work mm -hmm. or was too long at that moment in the movie so most of the music was t taken out again mm -hmm. so you hear only the latter part of the of the song but it was much more dominant and uh, uh, he had i had to written him an email saying finally i succeeded and put him uh, oh you were your brian voice ferry in my, your voice <laughs> in my movie yeah yeah sure yeah i'm a big fan still of uh, brian ferry also uh, of all the records like uh, dylan-esque and whatever when I mean, he did uh, Dylan, uh, like is it his, his true or is it just a rumor that you titled Flesh and Blood after the Roxy Music Absolutely. album? Absolutely, and wow. if you look really at his uh, cover of the, then you see basically it, say, it doesn't say Flesh and Blood; it sa says Flesh and then there's With a cross. The, yeah, just blood. as you and did. And we copied yeah. that completely. Yeah, yeah. I was at that time, I could only listen to Brian Ferry <laughs> or Roxy Music. It was really at that time uh, only. Rec so now I'm a big fan still and uh, r listen to all his uh, albums and uh, yeah, I think it's. He has still a very beautiful voice, in mm -hmm. fact. And yeah, he's still performing. I love little details like that. A slightly more complicated question, though, about L. There's a few mentions in the film about uh, Michelle's father, the mass murderer, being a, a monster, referring to him as a monster. And then throughout the film, we see Michelle does a, several things that you might consider also to be monstrous. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> I would think the most egregious would be that she instigates the deaths of both of her parents in the film. By coincidence. By coincidence. She, symbolically, she expresses herself uh, when her father uh, has committed suicide because uh, he is afraid to uh, meet her, isn't it? Uh, to see her after 40 years. Um, it's certainly uh, something that she didn't want to achieve, isn't it? Uh, the, he did that and then symbolically she says to him, my, my arrival here killed you mm. and uh, basically that's true mm -hmm. but that you cannot that's not murdering at all i think <laughs> yeah. well instigated maybe no not yeah. even <laughs> instigated but not with the yeah but uh, let's say in the courtroom that would really not yeah. hold up you know in any way definitely um what about um a character like patrick the ra the rapist he's a much more complicated character or at some points maybe you'd consider him to be so so-called monster well, you could be, uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, rape and 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 murder come comes close, huh? I would say. And so the the way, and especially at the end of the movie, when you start to realize uh, that he this might be a pattern in his life, especially when you start to uh, in the four last scene, you uh, hear that his wife knew everything about it. Uh, you could argue that he, um, you get enough information to see, to see that he is that he did did this with many women, probably, and I think that is monstrous. I wouldn't call it a completely monster, because there is of course uh, uh, we we indicate a little bit where it's coming from at least, but that doesn't uh, in any way makes it okay, of course, clearly. And so I I think I would call him monstrous. Instead of saying it's a monster, I mean, but it's close. At the press conference, you used terms when you were talking about Patrick, words and also Michelle, words like identification and empathy that you wanted uh, yeah, I didn't to... didn't use the empathy. Okay, sorry. Uh, identification then. You wanted to achieve some degree of identification with these characters who were, could be... Well, which character are we talking about now with Michelle? Well, let's, let's focus on Patrick then. Well, of course, uh, yeah, sure, but with everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, these are all human beings, so why would you not be able to step into their shoes, even if it's if it's the enemy? In fact, I'm, I'm, uh, that would be quoting uh, uh, Obama in Cairo. We say we should at least start to uh, step in the, f in the feet of our, uh, of our enemies mm -hmm. and look at ourselves from their point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's natural, especially as an artist, that you would look in, uh, that you would identify with, the, with that character. Of course you should. I mean, that doesn't mean that you would do that, but as an artist, you should follow that to a certain degree as much as you can. So to, to feel, and the actor would do the same, I suppose, you know, uh, Laurent Lafitte would certainly have to a certain degree uh, moved into a, what we now call monstrous character. Mm -hmm. So it's not that basically if somebody is evil or bad that you basically should suddenly uh, decide that you would 
not identify with him anymore. I think that's wrong. I think that's what Isabel was saying too, that you might feel like you're being led one way, but you shouldn't just so easily fall into that assumption that... No, of course not. In fact, let's say if you look at the movie like Starship Troopers, you the, 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 what's happening there in a very in a much more complex way that you make the audience identify with your heroes and at the same time interrupting that interpretation or that identification with, with the knowledge that these people are partially fascist. So basically, so I think that's the the correction basically on their fascist utopia mm -hmm. is in the movie itself. Yeah, and I think the, let's say when there was a problem with the movie when the movie came out, I didn't nobody saw that you know that it was really these are our heroes, but by the way they are also living in a fascist utopia. And that was, I think, what made the movie for me so interesting. So you identify as an audience, but then uh, basically at the same time, the director uh, and, and the scriptwriter give you information about you might not, because you have identified, you might not have noticed that there is a fascist, let's say, element there. And and uh, I think that's it's, it's very, uh, let's say, what you would call... Um, in the theater language, it's very Brecht, eh? it's very Brechtian that you, Brecht has said, of course, you should never as an audience uh, or, or write in a way that the audience identifies. Because then you are using, let's say, a drug because you, you see things already in, in the wrong way. You're not looking uh, really at the situation. You have identified with somebody and then you sympathize with him and you, you go to the, the, to the story in that way. But that should not be, according to, to Brecht, that should not happen. You should not do that. And I think in Starship Troopers, is, in that way, is, is an, uh, let's say, all the newsreels and everything around it is a Brechtian correction. On, on on empathy or or sympathy and especially identification to warn against that and in this case it's I, I, I don't think that applies to that really you know of course you uh, sympathize with Patrick because he's a nice guy and he's, and, 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 and he's helpful and uh, he comes to her so can I help you to uh, for, with the uh, when the wind is there and stuff like that so you introduce him as a, as a nice person clearly it's only later that you see that he's monstrous yeah there is no confusion there I think isn't it it's not that you sympathize with him at the when you start to find, find out what's happening. I think you are rejecting that, and um, and because you're rejecting it as a, as an audience, then that's why the third act of the movie is so difficult. Um, uh, let's say uh, for, was difficult for actresses uh, when we tried to make it as an American movie and uh, went to American actresses. I think it's really the third act that it doesn't go into what would be normal. Uh, uh, let's say revenge. Uh, she takes a road where you even with Isabelle Huppert, you might not identify. You might be looking at her. You might be believing that this special character is going that way and into, into that sadomasochistic direction, say. But I don't think you would follow her and identify with her. You, she, I, I think she is, 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 has been able in the movie to keep that distance, that you don't really identify. There, there is something unsaid and unknown in her behavior, in her acting and whatever, from the very beginning to the very end. Well, that leads me to that scene in the, in the basement, which I think is the most difficult, complex scene. The eroticism in, in that scene is very strong, but it's also very uncomfortable. It is. Yes. And I was, I was paying attention to the audience reaction, the press conference, and after the, the film ended. First, there was just one man next to me, and the, the film ended, and he, and he just said, Jesus. <laughs> and then he got up and left. But there were also a couple of women nearby who were a little bit angry, I think, at two things. One was the, the eroticism in that scene, and it seemed as if they were leading up to the conclusion that, that you were eroticizing rape or a rapist. But I think there's more going on in that scene than just that. Yeah, but yeah... <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you can see that. I so, mean, you're yeah. going to have to expect that some people are going to respond in that way. Yeah, sure. 
there is some, but it's clearly uh, that she is able to go in a sadomasochistic relationship. Mm. I mean, there's no doubt about that. That is not, and you can explain that perhaps if you want to. There is information enough in the movie to act, to think, okay, uh, what happened to her and this and that. But I think I have refused, the writer of the book refused, and the scriptwriter to connect her past to, uh, let's say, her behavior in the third act. Hmm. I mean, there is no connection. I mean, in the, Philippe Dijon in the novel tells about the father, tells about the horror story of, of her life, and she was 10 years old, but he does not say this has to do with the move in the third act. You know, he, he has separated that, and, and I think what the movie does, and Philippe Dijon, is give you that information, but it's up to you to bring it together. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what is completely different, basically, than in Basic Instinct, where you know everything precisely, everything is causality, this and that. Here, I think, for me, it was interesting to do something where you give the inf information to the audience without connecting the dots. That's, that's something that I've never done. Um, I have a theory that clearly is not right or wrong. It, it's just a film. But <laughs> the theory that I like is that the legacy of the father is actually connected to her son, Vincent, who is has these really violent tendencies, is not the brightest, not the sharpest tool in the shed. And at the end, he becomes a murderer. It's it's he's a character. I I, I don't have too much trouble imagining him killing, well, I think killing you, a bunch of people. If you say but let's let's make it very clear, he is not a murderer. Mm -hmm. He's protecting his mother, mm -hmm. and his mother protects him mm -hmm. because in the scene afterwards, basically uh, she is lying to the police. Mm -hmm. She wants to protect her son. She wants to she, she wants that the son will never know that what he did was, let's say not necessary mm. and that basically so i if you say he becomes a murderer no i don't think that that you can say that it's somebody let's say which it could fall nearly under under self-defense you know and and, his, and 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 in this case then his mother but if you say uh, let's say straight on he is a murderer i would protest i sure. would say that's yeah. not the case i mean that that is taking things out of context and and i think he doesn't know he thinks he basically that his mother is raped and basically and intervenes with the simple thing that is there a piece of wood basically uh, and basically hits him on the head mm -hmm. so i i i would say that uh, uh, also again in court he would be okay <laughs> I mean, and I, I, I feel if, if you make say, well, he becomes a murderer because, 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 mm -hmm. I, I don't believe it. No. Sure, sure. But I mean, it's I, a nice also, theory. Yeah? yeah, about that climactic uh, scene at the end with the piece of wood, there's another really quick, very simple quote from Hugh Pair that I liked that uh, about her acting style. And she said, uh, maybe my deep tendency would be to darken things a little bit even small details, a way of smiling at a certain moment when maybe instinctively I wouldn't have smiled. I know that little half smile that she makes uh, if he's is important. The, yes, I mean, and that was uh, uh, one of the few times that Isabel and I basically uh, talked a little bit about, uh, about what she felt. Normally I left it to her basically because I think she was intuitively continuously doing exactly what was necessary and what I felt was, was authentic and convincing. And we had, uh, that's the moment that the, the rapist basically is, is, is severely uh, wounded, <laughs> I would mm -hmm. say, but he, he gives her a last look in fact, before he dies. And then basically as they look at each other, we shot it in a straight way. She was looking at without, without any blank, really. She's played it completely blank, like she does a lot of stuff, blank. Mm -hmm. And then we discussed it after two takes and felt that it would be perhaps more interesting if there is something in her thinking or feelings that might indicate something else, you know, that might indicate a certain it's unclear what it is. You see it twice. Eh? The, 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 you see it only in her eyes. There's a certain smile, but a, a touch of a smile that disappears and it comes back. And uh, triumph is it say, her saying, you had it coming. On top of that, it says, I think certainly it says, well, perhaps this is not the worst solution mm. for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So 
that was definitely something that 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 was brought in after reflection. So I mean, it stands out as one of the fo f few moments that we, uh, Isabel and I, really ca talked psychology or character. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. which in general we never did. Mm -hmm. She makes another little smile, but it's more of a, a comedic touch after she fantasizes about murder, uh, killing the rapist when she doesn't know who the rapist is. She comes out of this this uh, little fantasy and she makes she makes a little bit of a smirk. Sure. No, she likes to. Uh, mm -hmm. She likes to. Yeah, of course. At that time, she would uh, probably be happy, very happy to kill this, mm -hmm. uh, this bastard. You know? I like how you said though uh, that the film is about not revenge. It's, no. Yeah, it's about. It's a revenge anyhow. It's yeah. divine revenge. Mm. <laughs> it's a revenge that she, that she was not looking for. It's interesting enough, basically, uh, talking about this fantasy mm. that uh, you notice in the uh, that she uses an ashtray. And basically to uh, crack his skull uh -huh. and be, and it's interesting enough of course at the end of the movie that's what happens yes so yeah. her, her dream or her or her fantasy becomes true mm -hmm. i mean that's certainly it's all true you know that's i mean and i don't know what that means but mm -hmm. that uh, for me it was kind of interesting that she has this fantasy and ultimately that fantasy becomes true mm -hmm. although not through her it mm -hmm. comes from another side, and that's why you would call it, let's say, ultimately it becomes, when you see her approach to the rapist in New, even, uh, in New Testament terms, which, be, of course, would be love your enemy, mm -hmm. the end of the movie is Old Testament. <laughs> yeah. Really. An eye for an eye. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I played, I mean, with my interest in, in, in the uh, figure of, uh, of, of Jesus, these elements, of course, played through the movie for me. And, uh, and I see these things, but I, I leave them there. I'm, I'm not pushing them into the face of, of the audience. You know, you pick it up or you don't. But uh, for me, there is these kind of correlations and secret desires that at the end and get fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, but in a miraculous way, sorry, and a coincidental way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that she forgives Patrick? Sure. Yeah. Sure, done. <laughs> Good. Case closed, I think. <laughs> I mean, she has the, the, she has already from the beginning nearly played case closed, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, especially in the scene in the restaurant when she uh, finally tells her friends basically that she has been raped. Mm -hmm. And the moment that she feels that these people are compassionate, you know, mm -hmm. and, and start to uh, look at her, oh, oh victim, oh, you're, so, you're victimized. Mm -hmm. She breaks it immediately off. She's over she it. doesn't yeah. want to be seen as a victim at all, and she doesn't want to feel like a victim. But that's very Isabelle Huppert uh, talking now. Yeah, maybe she has expressed that from the very beginning. You've mentioned uh, many times over the course of your career with working on different films how um, often you're, you receive a influence from your wife or your daughters. Uh, was that the case with this film at all? No. No. <laughs> well, with the exception that my daughter invented the fact that uh, that she should not be the head of this uh, company uh, of uh, writers. But mm -hmm. in the book, she's the head, the CEO of, of with Anna Consigny, with her partner. Mm -hmm. They both the head of a company that is uh, 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 of twenty scriptwriters mm -hmm. that work for uh, film and television. Mm -hmm. So their task is is to guide these scriptwriters, correct the characters, uh, look at the dramaturgical elements and whatever. Mm -hmm. So to coach all these scriptwriters, mm -hmm. we felt that that was kind of boring for film mm -hmm. because it's talk, talk, talk about about pr projects that you will never see and have no meaning for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was then my youngest daughter, basically, who was a painter, who uh, said, uh, well, make her the head of a video company. So it was a female suggestion. That was a good good suggestion, I think. <laughs> it really was. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it was fantastic. And then... And I didn't know much about uh, video games, in fact. And um, my, my scriptwriter, David Berg, knew everything about it. And he, he does that all the time. He knows all the language and, and, and how it works and stuff. And so when we had decided to do this uh, video game, then we found a company in Paris that, uh, that was uh, making video games. Mm -hmm. And we borrowed from there, from the things they had already, but then transformed them a little bit so we had a little kind of a certain story there mm -hmm. that would be in some way 
parallel to the main merit narrative or would be counterpointing it or whatever. At the end of the movie, she becomes, she comes out, she's a reborn, reborn, mm. isn't it? Did the original game have the, the rape in it or the tentacles or? No. No. No, yeah. no we had it. The tentacle rape is a, is apparently well, a, well, that was yeah. In, in, well, the original version of <laughs> the original version yeah. is really that it uh, l like in Starship Troopers that the tentacle goes into into the the head, uh, yeah. head which is then yeah. ultimately of yeah. course Patrick also. Eh? In the film, who? <laughs> no, it's true. It's Patrick it's, it's uh, happens true. to Patrick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who is uh, if you were to play that game though? Do you, you you play the character of the sticks, the the kind of demonic character? Or do you play the character of the of the woman? I have no idea. <laughs> I didn't go to that. We didn't go into that. I was that. just we, wondering about we it. We were, yeah, but then you have, yeah, sure. But uh, in the time, in, uh, we couldn't go that far, you know, uh, because we, we touched it twice, in mm -hmm. fact. And, and, and then basically the tentacles the, the, uh, that penetrate uh, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, in whatever direction, of course, mm -hmm. later. It's a pornographic version, the version that's mm -hmm. made by one of the. Uh, her colleagues, in mm -hmm. fact. That was, of course, us basically bringing this all in. Mm -hmm. Of course, we invented this, lit this little story, the elements, the, the, the characters, uh, the woman is from one game, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the evil monster or, or something, that the, 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 the bad, yeah, the evil force, mm -hmm. is coming from another game. Mm -hmm. So, and we combined it, and then they, because it's, the characters are anyhow in the computer, they can manipulate them very easily. It's, it's really the, the, we would not have had money to really invent completely a video game, but it would have been a couple of million dollars, you know. You must have come up then with the, the, the little part of the plot where her colleague superimposes her face over the. Sure. Yeah, because that couldn't have been in the in the novel with the script writing. No, no, absolutely not. We added that from the moment that we decided to, to do video games. That came to us as we were working and say, okay, we have to see a little bit of the video video game. So what do you see? And where uh, these people are discussing that uh, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a discussion about that game and that uh, that she has comments on, on how it is done and all that stuff. So that was really uh, something that we we adapted the video game mm -hmm. but um the original version is you, know, you can but you can buy that video game miss mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, this the little detour. monster yeah. yeah sure all right well i'll just have one more question then if if you can tell us about anything new that you're working on uh yes i'm well there's several projects um uh, two with uh with french producer saeed ben saeed one is still that he is is willing to do uh, my jesus movie um, but I'm not ready to do that yet. And the other one is, an, uh, is, is a film situated in World War II in, uh, in 1943 in Lyon, which is kind of about betrayal and, and with some really interesting female characters. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, very uh, diabolical. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> You've been listening to the Film Comet Podcast produced by Violet Luca and Nicholas Rapold, and edited by Michael Oatmark. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. Film Comment is a bi-monthly magazine published by the Film Society of Lincoln Center. Since 1962, Film Comment has featured in-depth reviews, critical analysis, and feature coverage of mainstream, art house, and avant-garde filmmaking from around the world. Visit us online at filmcomment.com slash subscribe to purchase a digital or print subscription to the magazine film comment at the heart of film culture for over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs>